Okay, we're rolling, we're rolling. I had a friend of mine living in St. Petersburg, and I said, Misha, tell me something. I know it's gonna be a strange question. Is this possible to buy a military submarine? Used one. And he said, what a question. Let me check. He called me in two days. And he asked me, do we want the submarine with missiles or without missiles? When I first arrived in America, I loved it. I loved everything. America, it was a country of opportunity. America, you know, whatever comes to your head, you, you can do anything. You wake up in the morning and I want to be a, a movie star. It's possible. I want to be a gangster. It's also possible. Basically, what we did we were burning stores. He used to do arsons in Brooklyn. He called it uh, Jewish uh, lightning. <laughs> in the States, it's very easy to do the arson job because you just need to put a little fire. The rest, the firemen do. They don't give a shit. They breaking everything. They putting, you know, foam everywhere. They putting water everywhere. No furniture is good for that anymore. We were a little bit rough, yeah. We were breaking houses, we were breaking furniture, TVs, you know, we were beating up people once in a while, you know, who didn't pay the... But we were like, like collection agents, kind of illegal collection agents. I made a very good money until my... I had a partner, and they killed him. I don't know who. But, you know, he didn't show up to work one day, and I went to his house, and they shot him. When somebody like that getting killed, and the guy is a serious guy, to me, it was a message. So what do you decide? I decided to move to Miami. Miami in the 1990s was still dealing with the remnants of the cocaine wars. You'd have to be the worst agent in DEA history not to be able to make a case in Miami at that time. During that transition from the cocaine cowboys, when there was bloodletting and gangs rivaling each other, and Russia started coming to town. They loved the sun, they loved the ocean. But it's also because of the excess South America. We have spies, we have killers, we have dope dealers. This is Casablanca. Tarzan migrated to Miami at the direction of some of his Italian organized crime buddies in New York, and he moved up by doing whatever uh, needed to be done. 
I don't know, sometimes you falling in love. So many pretty women. Why do you in love especially with this one? Because she's close to you, you, you find something. The air was mine. The sun was mine. The sand was mine. Till today, Miami is a place that I would love to live and where I would love to die. I call Porky's uh, two reasons. First of all, if you remember, in that time was a very popular movie, Porky's. I really loved those movies. And number two, because our original movie, Porky's, was filmed in this location. If you're gonna take the movie, Porky's, you're gonna see my club. My buddies in New York, the Passion Brothers, they tell me about a guy in Miami that opened a strip club that their friends heard of from Brooklyn. Russian guy goes by the name of Tarzan. So they said, go down there and check it out. Uh, you know, mention our name and uh, work with this guy, see if you can figure out something to do with this club. When we first got to Porky's, Tarzan had no idea what he was doing with it. He had really, like, dug a hole and was basically putting the bar in it. So Tony came in and took it from the bottom and brought it all the way up. We were the first club in South Florida to have what they call these feature shows where we bring out a porno star, and she laid on the edge of the stage. She opened the legs naked, right? And she had a little remote control car. And she had fastened a dildo on the end of it, a big dildo. And what she'd do is she'd give the remote control to the patrons, they give her five dollars. She laid at the end of the stage with her legs open, and the guy would drive the car back and forth with the dildo. So there was, you know, people were like, oh, what's going on over there? And the club went from that level to even another level. Everybody was coming to the club. It was packed. He classed the place up. He classed the place up. It was the roughest club I was in, for sure, by far. Porky's was definitely a place that you could get killed. Very dangerous. They always had the two guns. They always had the Beretta 9 millimeter on me, and I had always here on my head, I have a Colt. I was a cowboy. We can put this way. Russian money was starting to come in, you know, from Russia, from New York, and they found out a Russian guy owned a strip club. So this became their little hangout. I'm talking about hundreds of Russian guys that had connections. Russian gangsters. Heavy Russian gangsters. Tarzan became sort of a go-to guy, and people from New York to Moscow knew that if you wanted to come to South Florida, Tarzan could fix you up. You wanted a load of dope move, he'd find a way to move it. You wanted somebody killed, talk to him. You wanted prostitutes, he'd find them for you. All you needed to do was talk to Tarzan. we call the Red Scare. Now these Russians are threatening to turn our streets red. The Russian mob targeting South Florida. They are here in South Florida getting away with their crime spree because they are crafty. Crafty and brutal. One of our initial concerns was that the Colombian traffickers would come together with the Russian organized criminals and put the dope money together with the uh, military hardware that the Russians had and create a great threat to South Florida and the United States. So we formed the task force to investigate Russian and Eastern European criminal activity. The FBI provided a squad, and then there was a multi-agency side, which was uh, the Marshal Service, DEA, U.S. Customs, U.S. Immigration, U.S. Coast Guard, and then several local law enforcement agencies, which became Operation Odessa. We had weekly meetings of multiple agencies who had an interest or had information about uh, Russian criminal activity in South Florida. Porcus. The 
Lila. Yeah. Juan. How are you? How are you? Good. Are you working for Tarzan? Yes, honey. Hold on a second. Juan Almeida, who is he? Juan Almeida. <laughs> How do you describe a guy? He has so many angles. Juan Almeida have a lot of angles. I was first introduced to Juan Almeida through Tarzan at Porky's. I still love the guy if he, you know, no matter what. Tall guy, well-spoken, well-dressed. This guy had all the toys. I will consider him very shrewd, very intelligent, a good businessman. He was good at taking assets from traffickers before they went to prison and hiding them, mostly boats. And in many cases, though, it turned out the people would get out of jail or prison, they'd find out that he'd sold their boats. <laughs> and then he was so good at grifting people that before they ended their conversation, he had just sold them another boat. OK, so it's no secret that cocaine is cool. Tarzan was introduced to me by Vanilla Ice. I became friendly with some other people, uh, you know, famous basketball players, because they were coming to my club. Sting were coming to my club. Um, Vanilla Ice. One day, Vanilla, he introduced me to Juan. He asked me to take a boat. He had a 42 Tempest speedboat to repair it. And I told him where I'm going to take it. And he said he has a friend of his, owns a marina. When I went over there, I met Juan. Lovable person. Great talker. Good looking guy. I loved that guy from the beginning, from the first minute, and, and we hit on. First time I saw Tarzan, he struck me as a, uh, an oddball. He said, my name is Tarzan, and I've said, like, who? What are you, Tarzan? Where's Jane? He was selling cars. Um, he was willing and dealing. Fort Apache Marina was an executive playpen for the rich and famous. Julio Iglesias was a permanent customer there. The whole Miami Vice crew, Gloria Estefan, was a customer there. It was a good hangout spot. It was also a place where drug runners often hung out because it was a marina, after all, and uh, they could pull their boats out of the water once they did their dirty business, if you will. The way it works was, I don't really care what you do with the car, or the boat, or the plane that I sell you. That's your business. If you want to load it up and transport whatever you want to do, that's fine. Just don't tell me that, because I'm not a cop. He would come together with almost any criminal and, and uh, you know, he would sell his services to uh, whoever uh, would ever pay him for it. One time when the SL500 first came out, the Cali cartel asked me to bring him half a dozen of them. They ordered them like they would order donuts. They flew to Switzerland and I bought them at a Mercedes dealership and I loaded them on a cargo aircraft and flew them to Cali, Colombia. These guys had the SL500 before anybody else did. I mean, I did things like that. He was at the marina. He had the, all the boats, and he, you know, Juan came in. He came in not with a stack of $5 bills, but he came in with a stack of hundreds. Juan had money on him. He looked the part. He acted the part. And people viewed him as a drug dealer. Now, come on. This is pretty ridiculous. You spend a half a million dollars on a boat, and you're not even racing it or using it professionally. Nah, it's just pleasure. It's just a fun boat. That's all it is. Yeah? Is, is that, do, do people give you a hard time that you spend that kind of money on the... On a pleasure boat? There'll be a buyer. There'll be a buyer. He's around the corner. Oh, so actually, you're going to use it and break it in for him? Naturally. Naturally. We're going to give him a nice, good boat. <laughs> he was using his involvement in the cocaine business, as I understood it, uh, to keep his exotic car business going. Juan Almeida comes off as a much more serious guy. And even to this day, I don't know how this guy wound up in bed with Tarzan. <laughs> Shrimp. That's a lot of fucking shrimp. Ah, uh, yeah, but I mean, yeah. Jesus, I mean, the 
why why they need that much. I mean, you know, they, they hey, don't worry about it, buddy. The more you know, the more they sell, the more we make. So what the fuck? The anchor woman announced the Soviet Union, as a subject of international and geopolitical reality, no longer exists. Repeating once again our top story, Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev has been removed from power. There was a point in time where law and order was lost. No one knew who was in charge in Russia. And I distinctly remember arriving in Moscow and saying to myself, oh my god, everything is for sale? I mean, everything? It was just a, a complete free-for-all. In some point, we came here to Moscow to buy motorcycles. We wanted to travel to a motorcycle factory about 100 miles to the east of Moscow. And I had this idea uh, from owning my own aircraft in the States that we should just charter a helicopter. And I called the airport. And I said, excuse me, uh, my name is Tarzan, and we would like to rent the helicopter. And the lady said, to rent? She said, we never rent a helicopter. I said, do you have a helicopters? She said, yeah, they, we have like 400 of them right here, doing nothing, because in the time, Russia, they didn't have even gas for them. And I said, 400 of them, how about we're going to rent one? And uh, she said, let me call you back, we're going to calculate. They calculated, calculated, they called me by the end of the day, and she said, well, I'm sorry, you probably guys not gonna rent it because it's coming out very expensive. It's a helicopter MI-17 with the three pilots. It will cost you like back and forth, like $500. I said, how much? She said, $500. I said, yeah, you know, this is really expensive, but we are ready to pay. And I told Juan, they give us the helicopter for $500. And the guy said, listen, let's get 10 of them. Let's fly like 10 of them. Let's occupy that city. You know, Juan is like, you know, this guy, after a few drinks, he thinks he's Tony Montana. We finally uh, got to an area that we knew was the city and the pilot says, so where do you want to go? We gave him the address. He goes, well, I don't know where that is. And I asked the pilot, how are we going to find out where is the factory? And the guy said, we're going to land in the middle of the city. And we're going to ask for the direction. People were running to see the helicopters. Because the last time they saw helicopters, never. They never saw the helicopter. They were thinking that, I don't know, somebody came from the moon. And he just pulled over his helicopter and he made his approach right there. The kids had to move. <laughs> had to move. This guy just lands this monster right there. And the guy, you know, pilot jumped out. I jumped with him. And he see the lady, you know, with the shopping bags going. And he said, excuse me, uh, where is that uh, factory? And she said, son, you need to fly this way. I said, my God, you know, I love this place. And then the policeman come. He come with a motorcycle and with a little stick, you know, that white and black stick. He didn't have nothing else. He had a whistle. He had a stick and a whistle. And he was like looking at us, like we are aliens. And he said, who are you? I said, we are from Moscow. And that was it. From Moscow, that was the password. And he said, uh, OK, what do you want me to do? I said, I want you to stay and watch the helicopter. We purchased like 250,000 of motorcycle by the name Ij. 
we, we got those motorcycle for $200. It was like nothing. So these are the kinds of things that you can do in Russia at the time, which you know is unheard of. It's unheard of. And we had a great time. We enjoyed ourselves. We flew back. And then me and Juan and all the people, we were all so happy about everything. It was fun. pretty wild and crazy lifestyle. I personally flew a Gulfstream, a Gulfstream 2. Sometimes we'd go to Zurich for, for dinner. You know, me and Juan, we were flying in his helicopter to buy cars in North London. Who is flying with a helicopter to buy a car? <laughs> we were landing in Orlando buying 10 cars. He was saying, give me five Ferrari, five Maserati, five, five Lamborghini. Ciao. We lived a really nice life. Things worked out so well for Tarzan that he actually opened up a, uh, a restaurant in the North Miami Beach area, and that was called Babushka. So between his restaurant and his strip club, you know, he was getting the bulk of the Russians uh, coming to South Florida. Grisha Roses. Yeah. You're asking about Grisha Roses. You know, I'm always getting touchy when you mention this guy. Really, a good story of betrayal of a friend. Grisha Roisis is probably the worst kind of thug uh, that you could find in uh, Russian organized crime. He could kill you with his bare hands, and he used to tell me how to do it. And uh, I don't know how many people he had killed, but I'm sure that's more than one. You know, I really loved that guy. Really, the guy was like my older brother, like my father. He knew me from the childhood. He was a friend of my parents. His nickname is Cannibal. He was arrested once in New York. And what he did, he was so angry that he got arrested. And the officer who arrested him, he was putting handcuffs, and Gregory bite off his, his nose. He bite, actually bite part of his nose. After that, he received the nickname Cannibal. Grisha Roises became a major heroin trafficker. And uh, the feds, DEA in New York, finally nailed him. And he was facing probably near life in prison. And so he got out on bail and fled. And through Interpol lookouts and so forth, he was found in Bulgaria and arrested and thrown in jail. DEA heard about it eventually and sent a nice young agent from Vienna, Austria, to see Grisha in, in jail. And Grisha had no teeth because he said when he was arrested, the cops had kicked all of his teeth out with their boots. Well, the agent from Vienna, he said, we know you're associated with some major, major heroin traffickers, not only in New York, but internationally. And if you want to help us, we'll get you out of here. And he said, I'll do anything to get the hell out of here. At that time, uh, Tarzan was in debt with Babushka. I mean, it was a, a fun club, but it, it wasn't turning a profit. Somehow, he just got there on vacation. And of course, he saw my operation in Miami, and he really liked it. Tarzan and said, I need somebody to run this place, but also, I'm short of cash. I didn't want him as a partner in the restaurant, but I needed a little money, extra money. And I thought, you know, he was gonna do, he, he knew how to run a restaurant. 
So Grisha came to us, and we were able to get him 70 grand, and he, he uh, gave that to uh, Tarzan and Doc. Tarzan was in love with him then. Grisha was the maitre d' and manager and walking around in a tuxedo, and then started walking around with a camera taking photos of everyone and having, having fun in the club. He was putting pictures on the wall, but he was also giving copies of those pictures to us and going through those photos saying, this is Joe Blow, he does this. This is John Doe, he does this. And he's important in this area. And so one night at midnight, a bunch of us went in, DEA and the FBI, and wired some of the booths in Babushka for sound. And we gained a lot of intelligence that way. Nelson Yester, who was a fugitive that time and, and living in, uh, in South America, moving from location to location, was the closest conduit to the Colombians. And he was close to Almeida, and then Almeida was close to Tarzan. Nelson Yester Magnum, he got caught with the 41 passports. He had 41 names. He was a Cuban Secret Service agent. He was a pilot in Miami who was uh, flying the drug money. And he is a fugitive from the United States for many years. Tonight on America's Most Wanted. Marshals recently received this picture of Nelson Yester. Investigators believe Yester has a British passport bearing the name Hector Santana. He speaks Spanish, German, and English. If you've seen Nelson Yester, call 1-800-CRIME-TV. He's a brain. If we did any kind of operation, he was the brain of those operations. I worked a case of Nelson Yester for nine years. I started in 94. And we discovered that this guy was an, an international uh, smuggler and was a huge part of helping the cartels traffic in, in narcotics. He had contacts all over the world. South Africa, uh, Russia, Amsterdam, Venezuela, and in Colombia. He was a major player. He's very connected worldwide. He knows who to call. He knows exactly how to maneuver in that arena. He had a relationship with Pablo, and they worked together for many years. Pablo had a large network of dealers, if you will, and Tony was within that network. How dangerous of a guy is he? His reputation is that he can be extremely violent. He deals with cocaine dealers. Uh, he deals with weapons traffickers. He's really a bad guy. Tony can be extremely dangerous, if he needs to be. If you cross him, he will deal with you, and he, he's very unforgiving. Hey, I never have enjoyed killing anybody. I just want a few dollars. But when somebody has to go, somebody has to go. You know, that's... That's how it works. Time, 11 a.m. Case number G1-940158. Uh, Out. He was a fugitive from uh, the FBI, and he still is. He's still a fugitive. You think that would be possible to get him to talk? No. <laughs> I don't think so. Will Tony talk to us? I'm pretty sure Tony will not talk to you. Tony will not talk. 
because Tony is very serious guy. He is very secretive. He is very cautious. Never, never in a million years. AO55, Sony interview. Take one, Mark. Quiet, please. So for me to understand, in the power structure of Medellin, where do you fit in the power structure? Just you're fucking curious, man, eh? Just leave it like that. Why? Let's not talk about those things. You know, for me, being a player was in my destiny. It didn't took me too long, thanks to Jimmy Carter, when he eventually opened the Mariel Boat Leaf. I arrived there in the United States in May of 1980. And guess what? As soon as I saw that place, Key West, as soon as I got there out of that boat, and fuck, you know, I say, this is paradise. You see everybody there, you know, to a beautiful cars beautiful clothes. You are right there and you look at yourself and you go, you say, shit, man. Which one is the easiest way that I can be like that guy with that Ferrari? You know, me, I don't want to be with that fucking Chevette. So I just find out myself like oh, I was in a movie and I didn't like the script. So I wanted to be the director of my own movie. So, my next step was going to the gun shop and buying myself a 357 Magnum. Juan Almeida, who is he? How do you first meet him? You know, Juan, you knew about car more than anybody in Miami. So he can import a black market car from Europe. He knew how to bring his Ferraris and Lamborghini for Italy before anybody was doing it in Miami. So one day I wanted to buy a Ferrari and somebody told me, just go there. And there was a big water house full of all kind of cars. And went up there to try to make the deal. You know, there was one there sitting in his desk. He started to show me all these kind of car and tell me, no, that one is sold. I sold it to so-and-so and this and that. He was a great salesman. As you are running the motor in this room, you're watching your oil and your fuel and everything, just like a boat. Right. And then you're throttling it here on the computer. It gives you a printout of the horsepower and the foot-pounds torque and temperature. And that's how they actually test the motor before the motor is actually released. We went up to the office. We start to talk. You know, actually, I stay there sitting down, talking shit for the next four hours. And, uh, you know, I just saw that guy, you know, I, you know, I really want to be his friend. I've been on the run for a fucking long time, man. I'm, you know, I've been in the room since 1990. I'm still running. How many different identities did you have? I cannot count that high, man. He knew how to vanish. He used to travel extensively, and just when you were getting that information, you were already three steps behind him. It was a lot of fun for me when I used to go there illegally to Cuba, and I used to send a postcard to the guys there in the U.S. Marshal Office in Miami. I used to tell them, hey, guys, you know, I'm, what's happening? I'm here in the beach sipping a, you know, sipping a fucking mojito. I don't see you guys around here. When are you going to come down to pick me up? One day, I'm at the fort, and I see these very interesting characters pull up in a, in a Lamborghini at the front gate. They wanted two very, very special, highly specialized cigarette boats. 
and the requirements were A, the speed, and B, the distance. And uh, they were probably going to be used to smuggle large amounts of coke. So I made the sale. And from there on, um, I started to build the boats for them. It was a total custom job. And I discussed with them the possibility of putting turbines in the cigarettes. It's like an aircraft on a boat. In fact, the sound of it, when it's approaching, you have you look up to the skies because you think something's landing somewhere and you don't realize it's the boat. And so that elevated the price of the boats to a couple million dollars a piece, which was just outrageous, completely outrageous at the time. And so um, once I succeeded at selling them the turbines, uh, I had some brochures on my desk about some helicopters that I'd been negotiating turbines for, and they inquired about the helicopters. And that began the uh, sort of trajectory to acquiring specialized helicopters for uh, Colombia. And Cali, since they knew that I knew all the players involved, they told me, please, you know, just keep an eye on it. You know, make sure nobody get out of line. Two days later, he went there to have a meeting with me in Caracas. So I'm there waiting for Juan in the Caracas Hilton, and there Juan, he comes. Just walking towards me. As soon as they got there, Juan told me, hey, man, give me a hug, and this and that. He saw me, man, here's the guy. This is Tarzan. He said, fuck, I look at that guy. He looked like a fucking Russian bear. Big, I mean, I say, this fucking guy is trouble. But man, I have to tell you, two minutes later, I just love that trouble. Can I tell you, 30 minutes later, I was fucking laughing. One hour later, I just didn't want him to leave Karak. I just want him to stay with me. I loved him right away. He definitely looked like a movie star. I hated to go with him anywhere because all the girls were looking at him. And from there on, it was like, uh, such a great time every time that we hook up. I remember a story when we went to St. Petersburg and he uh, hired some prostitute and he fell in love with her. And he bought her some very expensive perfume. And then when he left, the girl approached me and she said she liked me more than him. And I was very happy that he didn't hear that. But as a friend, I told him that uh, right now I'm dating your prostitute. And he called and told me the first thing, you owe me the perfume. <laughs> Uh, he was serious about it. <laughs> <laughs> The helicopters were known as uh, Kamov KA-32s. The Kamov is a very unique helicopter. You know, I have uh, two rotors. I carry a big payload. Imagine a picking up a container and taking it for two or 300 miles. They could pick up 5,000 kilos of cocaine on a hook. Uh, these helicopters were very capable of that. So we contracted to purchase uh, two of those for Colombia. And I told them that I could buy those helicopters for a million dollars. And they said, well, if you can buy them for a million, we'll give you a million five. So that was a no brainer. We came to Moscow and uh, I said that, well, they would like to buy helicopters. And I said, how many do you have? And they told me, well, we have like 600 helicopters. Go take any one you want. So I succeeded in negotiating the aircraft from a million down to 650,000. The same helicopter in the United States was costing approximately $10 million. So here you're getting top technology uh, helicopters for a fraction of the price. I chartered uh, an Antonov 124. It's bigger than a 747 and larger than a C-5 Galaxy. It's a military aircraft. 
This thing is just humongous. I chartered that airplane for 250 grand. I understand today you could not charter it for under a million dollars. And inside that bell mouth, I just stuck these birds in there, together with motorcycles and all kinds of other stuff. So the Antonov 124 is leaving Moscow from a military airbase loaded with the helicopters and spare parts. And as the plane pulls away from the tarmac and it's headed down the runway, it's snowing, it's the, you know blizzard conditions, and suddenly some group of guys show up with machine guns drawn and they're pointing it at the airplane and they're not allowing the plane to take off. They point the guns at the plane and they say, you're not, you're not going anywhere. And these guys are the mob, the mafia. And wait a minute, and what are these aircraft doing inside this plane, leaving this country without our permission? No way. It's not happening. And then I saw two humongous guys, like a monkeys, monsters. You know, with the necks like that, you know, with a gold chain like that here and here. Huge. And those guys are leaders of the gang who is looking to collect money from us for the helicopters that we took without their permission. These guys are gun-wielding fucks. They heard that there's some helicopters leaving and nobody got paid any money, and what the fuck? We're not going to allow them to do that. So they, they pulled the plane back. I see five, six jeeps are standing there, and the guys are start coming out of the jeep. Each jeep has five, six people and each one of them with the machine guns. You know, with the Kalashnikov, with the gun, with the pommel. And the guys were rough, they were loud, they were screaming that you guy, you gonna pay. I said, what the fuck? Those guys came to work. And he told me, we want money. I said, you know, I'm not gonna give you money. But you know what, I can give you cocaine. I just came out of nowhere. I was playing a game. I didn't have no connection to cocaine. I didn't have nothing, but I just needed to talk. And he said, what? You can get us cocaine? I said, yeah. And I told him, listen, you know who is Pablo Escobar? And they said, whoa, don't tell us that you know Pablo Escobar. I said, Pablo Escobar? I said, I'm working with him. He's my partner. I'm going to make a phone call right now, and the Pablo can, I can put him on the phone. You're going to talk to Pablo. I'm in Cali, Colombia, waiting for that airplane, and I get a phone call from Tarzan. And Tarzan says, Pablo, we need to talk. I said, Pablo, you get, you get, need to get here to Russia. We do have a little problem, and we need to solve this. You get here in Russia and get here, please, tomorrow. Otherwise, I'm a dead man. And I was like, okay, all right. What does that mean exactly? You know, I didn't want to intervene uh, that much because those fucking hellos, they were so hot, everybody's gonna be here looking, KGB, CIA. You know, I didn't even want to be around. So I was there in the Swiss Alps in a chateau. And I was just, Naive, I was stupid, call me what you want. But I actually boarded a flight as if I was Pablo. And I showed up at Moscow Sherry Metro Airport. And these goons all picked me up in, in a Lamborghini Jeep as Pablo Escobar. And you know Juan looked like Pablo. I swear to God, if you're gonna look picture, if you're gonna take picture of Pablo, and you're gonna take picture of Juan, they, they're like twin brothers. They drove down that main boulevard when you leave the airport, 100 miles an hour. There was no law, there was no order, there was nothing. These guys were actually holding guns. They were impressing me is what they were doing. And when we got there, we stepped in this building and we went into their offices. And when we got up, there was a big boardroom, a long table, maybe, I don't know, 14, 16 chairs. And there was maybe 10 guys there. And Tarzan was the very little corner. He did not look like the Tarzan I knew. He looked like a deflated balloon. When he comes to grab me and hug me, 
Pablo. He whispers in my ear, act tough, act tough, be mean. And I was like, man, this is the real deal. Holy fuck, what am I gonna do here? Well, I present myself the way Pablo Escobar would. You know, just mean fuck. Don't talk, and whenever you talk, just talk like you're a fucking drug dealer. We sit down and we start to talk about this. Pablo, listen, so we know that those helicopters are yours. And we know that you need those helicopters to aid your, your shipments and all yours. Great. And so we just want you to know that we're not kidnapping. We're not holding them against their will. We want to partner up with you. We want to be your reps in Russia. OK. Yeah, we want to handle your cocaine distribution here in Russia. And I was like, OK, what are your capabilities? He goes, well, we'll take something like 50 kilos. And he's telling me, you're joking. I looked at the message. Are you kidding me? You, you brought me to Moscow to talk about 50 kilos of cocaine? Are you serious? And I go, come on. It takes me the same time it takes me to pack 50 to pack 2,500 or 5,000. 50? It's a joke. Please, don't tell me you brought me here for this. Don't tell me I came to Russia to talk about 50 kilos. And Juan is telling him, you are stupid, crazy, or you have a big cojones. Tell you what we can do. Get me a safe house. I'll bring some Colombians. We'll put them in the house. And as you need, as you get. You pay, you get. So you don't need to order that, that, that much, but you need to move the stuff. I can't keep it around forever. And they all looked at each other and they were like, how to show, how to show, good idea. Good, we can do that. Pablo Escobar is here. And I fucking grabbed these guys. The guy stood up and he hugged me and we got a deal. I delivered the helicopters in Cali, Colombia on or about April of 1994. And uh, I remember being there when the aircraft arrived and uh, it parked on the tarmac and, and, and it lowered. It, it, it was like on hydraulics and the whole front end started to lower like this. And then the whole nose gear just opened up like beautifully. They landed there in Cali and uh, that was a talk of it. Not just a town, that was a talk of Colombia. It was just perfect. The whole thing was perfect. Come on! When those guys, they saw that we was able to take those fucking helicopters out of Russia, they say these people, they can take anything. Being able to deliver on that deal like that, you sort of create a name for yourself. Doors were opening. Things were taking place. And we got caught up in that. I became wealthy, rich, known. I could do anything and everything. I wanted a yacht, I got a yacht. I want a Ferrari, I got Ferrari. Want a Mercedes, got Mercedes. I want the girls, I was getting the girls. And I bought a limo. You know, I had the driver was taking my little girl to a kindergarten. It was very nice feeling to live like that, you know, kind of like untouchable. I said, look, you're bringing a lot of heat here, man. I said, you're fucking driving a Mercedes. You got a limo picking your daughter up. I'm driving a Honda Accord. Because I was schooled from the old guys back in New York. This is how you, how you act, you know? You walking around with fucking $2,000 leather jacket on the Versace. You got to look like a regular guy. I mean, this is, you know, we're making money here doing things we shouldn't be doing. There were all kinds of stories and allegations about what he was really up to, so. We all decided to get an undercover in to see what he was really doing. He was a DEA special agent in Washington, D.C., who grew up in Brighton Beach, where both Grisha Royces 
and Tarzan also grew up. His name was Alex Yesevich. Growing up in the Brighton Beach area, I knew Grusha Roses very, very well. But I was never friends with Ludwig Feinberg. I seen him in the neighborhood. He saw me in the neighborhood, as I discovered later on. Both Alex and Tarzan uh, thought the same way, spoke the same way. They had the same ethnic values and ethnic backgrounds. And uh, it was just perfect. Alex and I sat down with Grisha before the first introduction. And Grisha said, I know you from a kid, you know? Ruizis said, hey, Tarzan, you remember? This is Alex. Uh, you remember him from Brighton Beach. You remember him when he was young. You remember? Ruizis introduced me to Tarzan as, this is our trusted man from New York. And that's when we figured out we knew each other from the old neighborhood, kind of saw each other all. So that kind of helped a lot. For me, it was irrelevant. Uh, if I know him a lot or long time, not long time, because he was a friend of Gregory. And to me, Gregory was as a family. In Russian, we're saying, your friend is my friend. So Yasevich automatically become a friend. So originally, it was more, let's get to know each other, then I'll tell you what I can do, what I need. And then we met in Babushka and Porky's back and forth until one time we walked outside Babushka. And that's when the decision was made, let's tell him exactly what I am. He said, look, let me tell you what I do. I'm into heroin and weapons trafficking but I want to expand my operations to cocaine. And that's why I'm in Florida, okay? He goes, well, let's see what I can do. Just don't tell me they have Nintendo here. You want me to talk? With Yasevich? He invited me to a hotel. I think it was Fountain Blue. And he was telling me, Tarzan, uh, why did you sit in this chair? You better sit in this chair. And I said, why would you want me to switch the places? Well, it's not comfortable for you to see me this way. Alex couldn't have been in a more precarious, dangerous situation. Because Tarzan was sitting there in an armchair with his legs crossed, and he had a a 38 Special, his ankle holes to point right at me. The camera was disguised as a device in the hotel room. It was a radio, which was connected to the wall, and I was sure it was a camera. He looked right at it, and he pointed and said, there is a camera inside this object. Because me and Juan, in that time, we were playing uh, spy games. In downtown Miami, we had a spy store. And I saw exactly the same camera in the spy store. And he said, no, it's scared me. No, 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 it's not the camera. I said, Alex, I swear this is a camera. Of course, he was 100% right. It happened to be a camera. I was right. I said, look, if you, you're full of shit. If you think there's a camera in there, go take the, the freaking thing apart. You know, don't freaking insult me. And he looked at it, he thought about it. And then he said, I guess I'm wrong. That cost me about five years of my life. It's stress. <laughs> After the meeting, we met as usual, and I crawled into his car, and we're talking about it. And he said, you won't fucking believe this. He said, they're getting ready to purchase a Russian sub and broker it to the Colombian traffickers so they can run dope to the United States. I mean, it just blew his mind. Nelson Easter. He was the man that uh, had the, he was the conduit to the money that was financing this deal. 
I was approached somewhere down there by very important people. So they told me, listen, this is the deal. We want to get this uh, submarine. And uh, I said, we can get it. I said, but what exactly you want to do with it? Because if we're going to use it, it has to be a big job. No, she says, I think that 40 ton will be appropriate. Shit, when he say that thing, I say, fuck, if I get all of that blow, you know, I'm gonna have the biggest reserve of fucking blow in the world. He told me, how much do you think this thing is gonna cost? So, right there, I thought of one, you know, one, you know, a long time ago, he had told me, Tony, every time that you're going to these suckers, just go high. You always can come down, go high. So I say to him, look, you know, I think that with 50, we can have a top notch equipment. So 50, 50 what? I said 50 million. He says, are you out of your mind? I say, yeah, but you're not putting the numbers together. You want to take fucking 40 tons? You know how much is 40 tons? You're talking about 1,000, uh, dollars a unit, one thousand dollars a key. You have forty million dollars in the first trip. We have paid the fucking whole team. He says, "No, no, oh, hey, hey, that's good." What's the price that you end up settling on? Well, you know what can I tell you? You know, I'm sure Tarzan tell you one price. I'm sure Juan will gonna tell you one price. But me, I'm the only one that had the price because they didn't knew. They just didn't knew these kind of people. They nice guys. You know, Tarzan and Juan, they nice guys. You know, they going to meet one of these people, they better bring a fucking box of toilet paper, brother. And eventually I make a deal with them and they told me, Tony, mijo, <laughs> be a stray with us. I say, I think that we can get it for 30 million and you just put $5 million expensive. So we settled for 35. I told them that I was looking for a fucking submarine, man. Fuck, when I told them that, they say, a yes, submarine? I say, yeah. She a fucking tars and he got out of the sea and says, what do you mean, a Russian submarine? I say, yeah, I want one of those big fucking things. He told me, you got it, man. You got it, we on it. I had a friend of mine living in St. Petersburg. He was a general director of a factory. And I said, Misha, tell me something. I know it's going to be a strange question. Is this possible to buy a military submarine? He called me in two days, and he said, the answer is yes. I talked yesterday to um, Admiral. Really? Yeah, he said that he got to the top of the top of the top. Really? For how many we want and anyone we want. Really? Yeah. Yeah, man, that's really good news. You know, that's, that's the kind of news that I like to hear. I called immediately Juan, and I said, Juan, we can get a submarine. Prepare yourself for travel. We're going to Russia. Tarzan, he told me we have a very important meeting this afternoon. We did meet uh, with the captain of the submarine. He did bring some Navy admirals. Fuck, you know, when I went there, I met these guys. There was so many fucking stars there. I thought I was looking at the sky. We had a talk in a restaurant, and all of them said, yes, no problem. You can get the submarine. After I don't know how many bottles of vodka, we go there to the sauna. So you know Tarzan, he's the first one to take the fucking clothes off and that big belly showing everywhere. You know, and everybody take the clothes off. He come to me, he says, listen, Tony, let me explain you something about fucking Russian because you don't know anything about Russian. I say, okay, explain me. He says, you see these guys here? 
You know, when you want to tell somebody in this culture that you trust them, you have to go to the sauna with them. You know what that mean? What that mean is that you have seen me the way I am. I don't have nothing to hide for you. So uh, please do me a favor and go there and take your clothes off. <laughs> I told him, son, he said, Tarzan, you, know, you know, I understand all that crap, but there's something that you have to fucking understand. I'm for fucking Cuba, man. There's, I have never seen a fucking sound in Cuba. And you want me to come here to Moscow to take my clothes off with all these guys? Say, no fucking way. He told me, man, fucking deal is going to be off if you don't go into this sauna. I said, listen, Tarzan, please go inside there. You know, let me digest this a little bit. and I will go a little bit later. He's just going there, start to talk to those people and this and that. And he's coming out says, you know what's happening? You cannot fucking believe. They offering me fucking nuclear weapon. Can you sell nuclear weapon? I said, fuck you. I say, are you mad? I said, man, you know, keep your fucking, keep yourself together. We're looking for a fucking submarine. We don't want no fucking bombs. He turned around and said, think about it. Fuck, he went back into the sauna. I just want to run away from there. I say, shit, man, you know, I mean, what the fuck I'm involved with? I say, I'm going to fucking get the electric chair out of this shit. So uh, he came calling me and calling me. Eventually, I went there and took all my clothes off, and I joined all these guys here in the, in the sauna, and I stayed there for a while. It was crazy. Tony said, listen, we're going to be able to get money to finance this deal only if we can get on a submarine. Almost any country who has the submarine assets, the submarine bases are the most closely guarded facilities. Without permission, you can't enter those bases, even if you're a member of the armed forces of that country. And of course, they said, you guys are welcome. Let's get into the submarine. I feel like fucking 007. You know, I mean, I go there and I walk inside of, of a Russian submarine and I think that we're going to buy these things. I couldn't believe it. He could not believe that we in the submarine, in the secret Navy base. I mean, they start to guide us everywhere. They show us a weapon system. They show us a electronic deterrence. They show us a communication department. When I was getting out of the sub, Tony told me, Tarzan, we have to get a picture. I said, Tony, picture of what? He said, picture of the submarine. I had a camera and I gave my camera to Tarzan. I said, Tarzan, just take a few pictures. I said, Tony, you're crazy. They're gonna kill us. And Tony said, I don't care. You take the picture. We're not going to get the money. We need the proof. I need a picture to convince those guys in Cali that I have been there, that this thing was not downloaded for fucking internet or anything like that. I came to the captain and said, Captain, I'm sorry, but I want to ask you another stupid question. Can I take the picture? And the captain said, the question is really stupid. The answer is no. I said, you cannot, it's a military base. You cannot take the pictures here. I said, we really need it. I said, how about $200? $200 was a lot, a lot. They were making probably a month, $20, $30. I offered him right there on a pier, $200. And what do you think? The guy agreed. I took the picture of Tony of the submarine. Then I took the picture of the captain of the submarine. Then somebody took the picture of me with the captain of the submarine. It's like we're buying a, a car. Like we're buying a used car, we're buying the submarine. Everything was smooth, beautiful. Mission is accomplished. Nice. 
So for these three individuals, one with the Israeli passport, one was, a, I think, believe a Cuban and a Venezuelan passport, they just walked into the base and not only walked into the base, were given a tour of the base. This is drug traffickers, criminals, getting access to a submarine base to, uh, to, to look and see and shop for a boat in a Russian base. That's just unheard of. So as Tarzan returns from our trips to Russia, he and Tony were taking pictures just like tourists take pictures of anything, right? And they would come back, Tarzan would come back with his camera, and Tarzan was leaving these pictures on his desk. And I started looking at them, and it was pretty, uh, pretty shocking. Little did Tarzan know that his buddy Yasevich, Agent Yasevich, he, of course, helped himself to all these pictures. So that's when we reached out to the, the Navy, U.S. Navy, and uh, we, we had meetings with some of their experts. We had the Department of Defense involved. We had NATO involved. We showed them the photos and asked them, can you please tell us if these photos were, in fact, taken on the Russian submarine base? They told us, yeah, they were. NATO's concern was, even though it was a noisy, old-fashioned diesel sub, that all diesel subs can go electric because the diesel motors charge up the batteries for the electric motors. And once it goes silent and goes underwater, it could disappear. It can't be impossible because Tarzan's doing it. He is crazy enough to try something like this. I quickly went down there to back to, to Colombia. I went there and talked to those guys, showed those fucking pictures. They say, wow, fuck, this is what we're getting. I say, no, no, exactly this one or something similar. I say, hey, listen, guys, if we zero about this, you guys have to pull the trigger. You know, there's no more delay. Those guys, they asking for the money. They want their money now. We're gonna do this. We need to move that sub out of there quickly. Detective Joe McMahon and I went over to Almeida's house in Doral. And uh, when we arrived, uh, the maid answered the door and we told her that we wanted to talk to Mr. Almeida. They were all over me. Michael McShane, the US Marshal, he was a real prick. They banged in the doors at my home while my family was there with my children, and they scared the living daylights out of them. The main topic of the questioning was his association with Nelson Yester, Tony Yester. We obviously wanted to know what he knew about him, but more so where we could find him. We never knew where Tony lived. One day he lived in Panama, one day he lived in Ecuador, one day it was in Peru, one, you know, we never knew where it's Tony. We went through extraordinary lanes to try to lure him to the United States. So I mentioned to Tarzan that I could have access to clone phones. He wanted one. The clone phones will have capability to make calls overseas, no problems. So I want that. So we went to Secret Service, and they provided us with a clone phone, which the FBI was tapping. So when he was calling you overseas or anywhere else for that matter, he was using the crap out of it. The bills were pretty high. We are recording all the conversations. Alex, in one of his meetings with Tarzan, said, I've got a present for you, and he gave him a cell phone. They said, here's a phone. Use this, it calls international. You know, free. He takes it, it's bugged. We had a big wiretap room at FBI headquarters in Miami with uh, Russian translators. And uh, that's how the DEA and FBI had uh, 15,000 hours of wiretaps. Believe me, 15,000 hours of wiretap, it's a lot. They're ready to work with us. They're ready to meet. They're ready to sit down. They're ready to negotiate. But they're asking, who is these guys? Tell us who we're dealing. Who is going to buy from us? Are they guys from the street? Are they serious? Uh, we know that they have money. Right, right. I understand that. They wanna, this is a big, 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 humongous deal. It's not that you're going from right. the street and you're buying a car. It's not a used car. The previous conversation was in response to a page from the page came in at 7.34 p.m. February 10th, 1995, case G1-940158. Uh, Essa Yasevich, out. 
I know that the clock is ticking. I know that Tarzan is gonna go down. I know that one is gonna go down. And I'm probably, you know, I'm, I'm probably gonna go down too. Juan and Tarzan, you know, they come with a fucking bright idea to take the money for those guys and keep it for ourselves. I just cannot happen to fucking laugh. I was thinking, fuck you, late. In all this fucking meeting, you know, I'm still looking at this guy and I say, fuck, you know, how come he running this big cartel, making few billion dollars a year? Organizing 80% of the dope that is going up there to America, 90% of the coke that is going there to Europe, and you think that you can pull something like this. So I went back to Colombia, and I went there to those guys, say, man, this is the time. We have to do this. It's no more time. This team belongs to us. You know, deal is closed. We just had to do the payment. You we went, we rock and rolling. And they say, sure, you know, where do you want the money? I say, no, I'm not gonna make the whole payment. Of course, not. I just need 10 million now and get ready because we're gonna pay then in three, in three steps. I say, so that's exactly what I need. I need 10 now and I'm gonna need 10 in the next two weeks and we go, and and another 10 in the next two weeks. So they say, cool, that's fine. So when they say that's fine, I say, shit, got fucking 10 million. I cannot contain myself. I was looking at myself, counting that fucking money. You know, I couldn't wait to get fucking to Europe to put my hands in that pile of cash. I didn't fucking remember who I'm, Tarzan, Sutton Reeves. I took the 10 million and I have a friend in Amsterdam and I asked him for his apartment. So I unload the 10 million in his garage. I took 10 grand, I put it there in the counter. And he arrived, he had 10 grand there. He come and told me, what is that? So I told him, listen, I want you to take your girl and go for a few days. I'm not gonna tell you why. I just need to use your house for a few days. He told me, fuck, yeah, man. Fuck, I going to Spain. <laughs> I mean, when I had to leave, I say, now just get that shit. Take your fucking password, split the scene and make sure. You're the only one that knows that I'm here. Don't even fucking show your face here in two weeks. Hey, those 10,000, when you come back, if everything is cool, you will have another 10,000 in that fucking counter. Fuck, I cannot tell you. Fucking guy, you know, pat his back in a fucking second, he was fucking gone. I disconnect the phone. I went there and sit and I had a drink. I had 9,990,000. And you know, when you get 10 million, one of the things that you're gonna find out is that they look like fucking 10 million. It's a lot of fucking paper. It's a lot of fucking papers. I say, thank you, Cartel de Cali. You know, this looks great.
I was in Miami running my exotic car rental business, and the phone call came. Kali cartel member, where are you? We'd like to meet with you. Can you see us tonight? Sure. Guys flew into town, and next thing you know, it's like, let's go have a drink. Let's talk. We went out and partied that night, drank best wine, best liquor. We had women. We had everything. It was the greatest time. The next day, they woke up at like 4 in the afternoon, called me up. Can we meet? Sure. So they did it right, because we had a great time. You know, we broke bread, and we had we partied together. I said, Juan, there's some things we need to know. We need your help. OK. You know your friend, Tony? Suddenly, he's gone. He's on the run. He's not around anymore. But we know where he is. We just need your help. I was like, really? What do you mean? He goes, well, you can start off by telling us where his family lives. Where's his wife and where's his kids? Oh, what do you mean? What are you talking about? So yeah, where does his wife and children live here in Miami? We know you know that. Why would you be asking? He goes, well, he's not around anymore. He's gone. And he took our money. What? Yes, a lot of money. And I'm like, you're kidding me. So yeah, you need to do this for us. OK. I remember I had a white Rolls Royce at the time. I jumped in the Rolls. I drove them, and right at the front of the house, they looked at the house and wrote the numbers down. They wrote the numbers down. Because, OK, we can go. He said to me, here's the deal. Talk to him. Talk sense into him. Tell him we're watching him. He's not going anywhere. Juan got him on the line. Uh, he said, Tony, we have to talk to you. The situation is getting hot. Juan goes, Tony, fuck, man. I've been fucking worried about you. I said, man, what's the fucking worry? He told me, man, where the fuck are you? I said, what's the problem? And I told him, buddy, you're in a heap of shit. He says, man, you have a heat. Looking for you, and looking for you bad, brother. We were sure they're going to kill Tony. We were absolutely sure, because that's what Juan was told. These guys are the real deal. They do business differently. They've explained it, and the way it works is real simple. If you cross them, they have to do what they have to do to just earn the respect that they need in their business. If word gets out that you crossed them and you're walking around, then no one respects them. I said, what's the heat all about? I says, man, only thing that I can tell you, they're going to hit you, and you better run. I don't know what's fucking going on. Only thing that I can tell you is that they looking for you every fucking where. Go to fucking Australia, go to just disappear, brother. Just disappear. Hello? Yeah. Hey. Yeah. What happened? They said that they're trying, they're going to put me behind the bars. To show them that they are really cracking on the Russian mafia. And uh, can I give you a piece of advice? Get rid of that piece of shit phone that you're using. That's the last problem you need right now, is doing what you're doing with that phone. Get a normal fucking phone and pay for your shit, OK? Yeah. That's why I have been avoiding you when you call me, because you are under a fucking investigation. But don't give them the right to put you in fucking jail. Yeah. Good morning, Miami. It's sunny at 78, another beautiful day in the magic city. One day, I woke up. Regular beautiful day in Miami, sunny, stunning. Woke up my daughter. I uh, give her a bath. Uh, dress her beautifully. Papa. Um, hey, Papa? No. What? Papa? Took my two guns, like always, with me. Um, put her in the car. And I was driving quietly with the music, put a seatbelt on my daughter, and holding her by the hand, and we were driving. 
but inner feeling was telling me something is wrong. I look left and right, driving slowly, enjoying myself, kind of feeling that something is in the air. We thought that Tarzan found out that he was being investigated. We're not sure how. It could have been a leak somewhere. So the decision was made to arrest him. We followed him to drop off his daughter at kindergarten. I dropped my daughter in Aventura school. And then as soon as I pull out of the kindergarten, I see them in a the rear view mirror. They were driving slow. I say, oh my God, here we go. I drove slow, knowing that something is going to happen right now. And of course, I see the woo, woo, woo. Then we stopped him. They placed him in my car. And then I said, um, am I arrested? And uh, Brent Hinton said, oh, no, 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 you're not arrested. No, we're not arresting you. I said, good, the dad don't want to come with you. He said, no, no, you need to come with us. I said, but I don't want to come with you. He said, you have to come with us. I said, why do I have to come with you if I'm not arrested? I don't want to go with you. You want to arrest me? We're not arresting you. I said, I don't want to go. No, I think you need to come with us. I said, OK. And we drove him to the DEA office. I was in Moscow uh, closing a $47 million deal for the heli taxi company. And when I arrived there, I was traveling with my lawyer, who's Jewish, and who wanted to visit the synagogues in St. Pete, which are beautiful. And so I called up Tarzan's brother, and I said, do me a favor, can you take my, my attorney, take him to visit the synagogues, uh, and then we'll, do, we'll get business knocked out. He says, what are you talking about? Do you not know what's happened? I said, what do you mean? He goes, my brother was just picked up yesterday morning in Miami on a major cocaine uh, distribution case involving submarines. What are you talking about? He goes, I'm telling you, my brother has been arrested, and there's a manhunt out for you. And Brent Eaton said to me, hey, Tarzan, you like in deep shit. I was saying things like, you're either going to go home today, or you're going to go to jail. It's up to you. And he kept saying, well, what did I do? Explain to me what I did. I didn't sell nothing. I didn't kill nobody. I didn't steal from nobody. I didn't do anything illegal for them to arrest me. They're not just going to arrest you because they talk about it. You have to do something in furtherance of the conspiracy. And he did that. He flew to Russia. He did negotiate for the submarine. say, you know, maybe I'm getting nervous here. Maybe these guys in Miami here don't understand how do this, how do this work. Maybe, you know, I'm chasing my way to Spain to see if they really have another 20 million. So I got my plane to Madrid. I went there, organized my crew, called four or five people, bring the hardware, get ready. We're going to fight. You know, I have to defend myself. You know, I have to make sure that I was not going to turn my back to the next 10 million. So I went there to Madrid, I called the guy. I told the guy, listen, you know, I just flew to Barcelona. I'm going to take the fast train for Barcelona to, to Madrid. You know, I call you as soon as I get there to the train station. So we there like uh, one hour before the train arrived from Barcelona. So when the train arrived, you know, I called that number. So that number responds, hey, how are you? I say, no, I'm fine, but where are you? We don't see you. And then I'm just in the, in the parking lot, you know, like, I don't know, 100 meters away in a car with two guys. I have another guy there in front of the terminal. 
And then, you know, I didn't know what to say. And then, you know, I just look and there is a, there is a taxi there with a the guy sitting in the front. And I say, man, you know, I'm here in the taxi. I'm sitting just right in front of the terminal. You don't fucking see me in the fucking taxi. Fuck, I say that immediately. There are like 10 of them, they jump in the taxi. They just took the driver. They took the guy in the front. They jump in the back. They follow with the other car. They fucking drive, you know. You know, start to make a few moves. I stay there, you know, fuck, we just leave the terminal. I mean, there is no doubt. It was there waiting for me. We just took in the car and we just left. A few minutes later, they called me back to the cell. The guy said, hey, what's happening, amigo? Don't the South State? So I told him, I'm in the fucking taxi. You didn't saw me. He said, no, no, I didn't saw you. You know, where are you? We're just looking for you here. I told him, listen, brother, you just missed the opportunity. I'm already gone. I see you later. Please, you know, say my regard to those guys and tell them that I hit them for 10 million and tell them to fuck off. It made major headlines. We were on the front cover of every major newspaper in the world, from Vanity Fair magazine to Playboy magazine, you name it, all of them. So when you make the New York Times, when you make America's Most Wanted, you're in deep shit. There were very clever prosecutors and agents who knew what they were doing. They threatened him, they were taking his child, and last minute, they flipped him. You know, sometimes he loves people. So I say, well, you know, I may go into guitars and a bar. But after I spend a few millions, you know, his commission or whatever you want to call it, I reduce it to 500. But after he flipped, I was not going to finance a fucking rat. We did our smart FBI, we did our smart DEA, we even did our smart to the court. You know, after all, I was free. My partner, Juan, who received 40 years, was free. And basically, none of us in jail. You know, one thing I guess we never discussed between us, each one of us, me, Tony, Yester, and Juan, we were planning to rip the Colombians. Uh, I didn't have no access to the money. Otherwise, I would already be taking the money. <laughs> um, yeah. Did they ever stop looking for $10 million? I had to tell you, all my enemies are dead and I'm happy. I'm gonna see them in fucking hell when I arrive there. We're still friends. We're still doing business together. We're not buying submarines, but we're still doing business. By 2000, I was organizing another sub. Since that case in Colombia, up in the mountains, they found a Russian submarine being assembled. They come, they raid, and they find that fucking sub. Almost finished. And that was a fucking little weapon that really had the capability to do exactly what it needed to be done. I always wanted to know, what is the difference between the agent and a special agent? What was so special about those guys? I mean, they were super good looking, 
What was special? Well, what was special? Why he's special? Why he's better than me? I'm also was special. I didn't tell them that I'm a super Tarzan, you know, a special Tarzan. I just was a regular Tarzan. I scored 10 million. Can I fucking believe it how fast I spend it? For hot living lessons, for genies, rock in love, us driving in the beanies, jealous. Cause I'm out getting mine, chain with the gauge and vanilla with the nines. Ready for the chumps on the wall, the chumps acting young because they're full of eight ball. Gunshots ranged out like a bell. I grabbed my nine, all I heard was shells. <laughs> 